Dr. Hurt, there you go. See your video. Can you test your audio, please? You can unmute yourself to test your audio. Okay. It doesn't look like you have your audio turned on. No, she's not even got her audio. There's no audio oh, sign over here. Audio. Can you do your computer audio? It doesn't show that you have any computer audio right now. Is that her? Yeah. Calling in 250 Okay. Tell, ask her what her cell phone is. Yes, do that. Do the joint computer audio. Is ask her if that's your cell phone. Is that your is your phone number the two five six number? No, it's uh, oh. five two five. Five two five. Two five oh zero 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 six. No, that's not her. Um so her computer says it doesn't support the audio. Okay. She can chat in the chat box. So try to change your audio. Try to change your audio. Uh, if you go to your microphone, mm -hmm. I feel like we need to go yeah. ahead. Is that okay? Yeah, I'll go out. Can we go ahead and get started? Sure. Okay. Did you start? Hey, Danielle. Yes, yeah, she did. You're YouTuber. Yes, we're YouTuber. Okay. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Um, Danielle's going to continue to try to help Dr. Hurt um, solve her audio problem. Um, Dr. Gocher is going to join us as he can. Okay. Um, so we will need someone to chair the meeting this evening. Um, so, and then let's see, I see all the board members except for Mayor Jacobs. You mind turning on your video? I'm going to ask the board members to be, I think the public would like to be able to see us. Um, so, so the, um, to get somebody to share the meeting, um, a simple majority from the board will work, or is, is, it, I guess, is anyone willing to chair the meeting this evening? Um, everybody has the agenda. And okay, hearing none. Um, um, but we will need somebody to chair the meeting. Uh, wait, I have a chat. Oh. Dr. O'Brien wants Dr. Sousa to chair. What? <laughs> um, if, if you give me a minute, I don't mind chairing it, but I've got, I need to, I'm having trouble up getting the agenda to open on my computer. So just okay. give me a second. Okay, sure. um, I've got too many, too many windows open, I think. Yeah. Um, and I, right. I would second that. So <laughs> need to load on that, Dr. B. <laughs> I, I well, actually, know. you guys could probably pull up the agenda there, can't you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so why don't we do that? That's probably the easiest um, way. Actually, I can't. No, I, let me think. That I'll have to find it. That Myers Morton, pardon me. Yes, sir. One of the board members needs to call the meeting to order, and then the first order of business is to elect a, a, a chairman pro tem. Sure. Okay. Sure. Did you guys, did everybody hear that? Yes. So Dr. Buchanan, we have a quorum, correct? We do, we do. Okay, uh, can I call the meeting to order then? Sure. Okay, That'd be great. and now I move that we uh, elect a chairman pro tem. Do I, are there any nominations? I move that Dr. Sousa be the chair pro tem for this meeting. I second that. Dr. Buchanan, do we have to have a roll call vote on that one? We do. Okay, would you mind going ahead and doing that, please? Um, so, just to catch- just That's to Dr. S Dr. Suisse, are, are you okay with that? We should ask Marcia, are you good with that? That's fine. Okay. So, um, Dr. Drake, unmute yourself, please. Yes. Oh, okay. Dr. Gotcher's here. 
<laughs> He's going to be in and out, so. Oh, all right. <laughs> we need a, uh, Dr. O'Brien. Uh, vote yes. Dr. Shamia. Yes. Ms. Wagner. Yes. Mayor Jacobs. Yes. Dr. Hurt, can you type in the chat? And Dr. Gocher, welcome. Yes. Okay, is that a yes? Probably yes. shake your head. Yes. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, all in favor. So, Narda, do you want to go ahead and proceed with roll call? Certainly. <clears throat> um, Drake? Yes. Here. Roger? Here. Kurt? Um, Jacobs? Here. O'Brien? Here. Shamaya? Here. Sousa? Here. Wagner? Present. Dr. B? Dr. Hurt, can you speak? Yes. I think. I can finally hear everyone. There you are. Uh, there, there, yeah. okay, there I am. There we go. The Dr. Hurt made it in. Here I am, present. Thank you. Okay, as, as the mayor stated, we have a quorum, and Dr. Suza will turn it over to you. I, I can find and pull up the uh, agenda if you need me to. Um, that would be great because I'm buried in the various emails and trying to pull it up that would be good to have. And Dr. Gotcher, it's good to have you here, and hopefully you can hang in here. and. Glad to be here. I've got, I will probably have to drop in and out for a little bit. So I'm right actually in the middle of something. Our residents are doing a good job. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes. You have the agenda pulled up? Okay. Yes, we're going to share the agenda now. Perfect. My staff has it pulled up. So. Okay. Can you see it? Um, we can, yep, now we can. So there we go, there's our agenda. All right, perfect. Um, okay, so we've already got a call to order and establishment of a quorum. And so I guess our first order of business is approval of the minutes from previous meetings, uh, firstly, uh, May 20th of 2022. Uh, were there any additions or edits? I think we discussed this briefly last time, and there's a few minor edits to it. No, sorry, that's the that's our last quarterly meeting. Right. Actually, we're combining the quarterly meeting with this meeting today because it, it was scheduled to be today at noon. So that's our quarterly meeting minutes that were back in May 2020. Correct. The budget was approved. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So, so basically, we just need to approve those, right? Yes. Um, so are there any edits, changes that need to be made? From anyone? Can we approve them? Okay, I've got a motion. Second. Second. And a second. Okay, so Diana was the second, uh, the first. Who was the second? Pat O'Brien. Pat, okay. Uh, do we need to do an individual call for this or not? We do. Everything has to be roll call on. Okay, um, so I guess Narda, if you want to do an individual call for this, just for approval of the May 20. 2020 meeting minutes. Okay. Um, Drake? Yes. Gotcher? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Jacobs? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Shamaya? Yes. Sousa? Yes. Wagner? Yes. Thank you. Passed unanimously. Thank you. Great. That's an easy one. Okay. So let's move on to the next one uh, is essentially the same thing except for our July 1st, 2020 meeting, which was the special meeting we hosted. We had two weeks ago. Um, are there any edits, corrections that anyone has seen that we need to update? If none, I'll entertain a motion to approve them. So move this, Mayor Jacobs. Okay, I've got a first. 
motion. Second, Dr. Tremia. Okay, in a second. All right, if we can again do our roll call vote. Narda, thank you. Yeah. Drake? Yes. Gotter? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Jacobs? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Shemaya? Yes. Sousa? Yes. Wagner? Yes. Thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, so I guess our next uh, order of business is a general health department update. Um, I assume that's going to be Dr. Buchanan. It will be, and it, it'll be short and sweet. Um, so one is um, that our community health assessment was to be released in May, April. And um, COVID happened and uh, we still have it. Uh, we're actually working on final edits and we'll have it out um, hopefully soon, re relatively soon. Um, Unfortunately, the data will be older than it was in April and probably uh, not as accurate, but we're gonna put it out there um, because people need to know where, where our community was health-wise. Um, the other thing that's going on right now is that we are uh, trying to schedule for back to school. Um, the uh, uh, requirements for immunizations for schools were not uh, relaxed. And so therefore we need to try to get kids vaccinated we're pulling in a lot of partners, the school nurses, hopefully are gonna be able to help us uh, with printing vouchers and things like that. Um, so, uh, and so that's that's one thing that also related to that is whether or not we're gonna be able to even try to do flu mist in the schools simply because of the need for social distancing and protecting the staff, our staff, the school staff and the kids and how, you know, because we bring kids down in big groups um, we're just thinking about different ways we could accomplish that. This flu vaccine will be important this year um, and with COVID, because, because COVID will still be circulating again. Um, and then we did get the contract for some COVID funding. Funding it actually ended up being a total of um, 7.1, a little more than $7.1 million um, to help with some uh, testing and COVID related staffing. Um, that will hopefully be approved by County Commission this month. And, I will be able to move forward with getting some folks in to help so that we can do things like back to school vaccines and even think about doing some of this. So we're excited about that. So that's that's all I have for the general health department update. Do you want me to go ahead and move on to staffing and operations update? Uh, is there any questions? Oh, for sure. Thank you. For Dr. Buchanan? Hearing none, let's go ahead and dive into your staffing and operations update. Sure. So just to kind of give you give you all a sense of where we are, we are in still in our continuity of operations plan. So well over 75% of our staff are working on response related activities um, seven days a week um, at a very intense pace um, and have been doing that for several months. Um, we are still providing limited family planning services. We are also doing uh, WIC services virtually, which has actually worked great. Um, WIC participation is actually up. Um, we are providing limited vaccinations, um, some dental services, our parents and teachers, and our uh, CHAMP program, which are home visiting outreach programs, are being done virtually. So those services are still being provided. Um, and we do still have some growth available. We actually have about 20 audits between now and sometime in August that will take place from the state. So we're continuing to do those things while also um, addressing uh, the, our COVID response. Um, so we're hopeful that um, with this funding, we'll be able to, to increase some of the services that we haven't been doing and uh, be able to get back to some more regular operations um, that we haven't been doing as well. So that's our goal. Any questions? Yeah, any questions from the floor? This is Mary Jacobs. I just had a comment. Um, with everything going on, and uh, we're all aware of COVID-19 and uh, how important that work is, but there's, it's all of the doctors on the call know as well. Uh, there's a lot of other things that are going on as well, and a lot of things that the health department does. 
in its normal day-to-day -day operations. So I just want to, again, recognize Dr. Buchanan and the health department for everything they do, not only in their response to COVID-19, but also in their day-to-day -day operations. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for Dr. Buchanan? Hopefully this will certainly help out the staff. I know that you guys are running ragged for the last four months and a little bit of help will certainly go a long way, I think, with keeping people's morale up, keeping them healthy. Um, okay, so let's move on to um, number seven on our agenda, which is the benchmark presentation. Um, so, yes, and for that, I think, um, Catherine, are you gonna, oh, I'm gonna share my screen. Actually, so not if you can stop sharing, Cherry, then I'm gonna share my screen. Um, nope, that's not there. Let's Oh, there it is. Okay. So now I think I forgot. Oops. That's so much. All right. Um, bear with me. I got it. Yeah. I need to make it full size. Oops. You don't want it in blue. Okay. So you just, you just turned it off. Oh, you did? Yeah, we're looking at YouTube now. A stationary. Okay. YouTube. I apologize. Let's try that again. There you go. Are we back? Yep. Okay. Is it moving? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm not going to review each the, the, the top part there, but this first benchmark sustained reduction or stability in new cases for 14 days. Um, as you can see there on the bar graph, um, we have had several consecutive days with um, significant and continuous increases in new cases with our largest increase yesterday of 118 new cases. Um, and this is uh, red light, and this traffic light is currently at red uh, due to the concerning trend of the rate of increase of new cases. We expect the new cases to increase, but our rate is, is significantly higher than it had been. So that's concerning um, for us um, as, as a community, as a health department, Second benchmark, um, um, community-wide sustained and increased diagnostic testing with consistent or decreased test result reporting turnaround time. For this benchmark, we have two bar graphs, one that shows a sample of the test conducted for Knox County residents and the other for the average time between specimen collection and lab report data. This week, this benchmark presents some challenges because um, there's been a, a great, greater lag time between tests that are being conducted and when they're being reported to us. Um, this is due to lab delays for multiple reasons. Um, one, just simple increased volume, slowing down the process, availability of testing surprise, supplies, excuse me. In some labs, um, the lab we have been using most often, AEL, has had some changes in pro internal process, which has also slowed down uh, results coming back to us. Um, We've also heard anecdotally from other providers that they're seeing slow um, in this process. We are currently looking for um, other labs to help to work with us. Um, and so because of this delay, um, we, we have this, sorry, this benchmark is also uh, red. Um, um, third benchmark, sustained or increased public health capacity. Um, our aim under this benchmark is to reach out to cases within 24 hours of close contacts within 48. And we've been able to continue to do that in our staff, either utilizing health department staff, other county department staff, and some volunteers. Um, so this remains at uh, green, and we're hopeful with the funding that we'll be getting and increased staffing, excuse me, that will remain at green throughout the pandemic. Uh, so we're hopeful that for that. Um, next is the healthcare system capabilities um, remain within current and forecasted surge capacity. Um, uh, these graphs are from the hospital resource tracking system um, or Hertz, and they show the regional hospital capacity in use. Um, and the top graph you see inpatients um, in uh, regular beds, um, ICU and ventilator use. Um, and then in the second graph, you see folks who have been tested for COVID-19 
um, in the hospital across the region um, in regular beds, ICU, and ventilator use. This uh, uh, benchmark remains at yellow. And um, because of the increase in our hospitalizations, um, but if you look at overall capacity, it hasn't really changed that much from last time when we reported this to you. Um, so hospitals have been able to uh, maintain capacity. And um, I think Dr. Shamia might have some more to say about that later. Um, so, uh, and then our final benchmark, which is sustained or decreased COVID-19 COVID related death rate for identified positive and probable cases. Um, and for this benchmark, unfortunately, uh, because we have gone from five deaths to 15 um, in the last week, two weeks, this benchmark is at red because it's sustained uh, or because of the, the rate of increase. Um, and though the number is not very high, what's most concerning about this benchmark is the rate of increase that we've seen. Um, we have, we had a death reported, we have, have we had a death reported every day this week? Okay. Yeah. So, but it's just in the rate of increase. We went for so long without any deaths, which was great, but unfortunately we're not seeing that now. Um, so I'll pause there and see if there are any questions about the benchmarks on anybody on the board. Okay. Yeah, are there any questions? And just um, really quickly, I'm not sure who's controlling the Zoom meeting, but can you put a mute on? There's a phone that keeps clicking in and out. Yeah, so when you're not speaking, if you'll mute yourself. Yeah, just make sure to mute yourself because otherwise we're getting some a little bit of feedback. But sorry, go ahead. Um, questions about the benchmarks. So, uh, Dr. Buchanan, um, I, I've got, uh, just from the hospital perspective, a few things I could elaborate on, uh, particularly on the last few benchmarks. But before I would do that, and uh, if, assuming this is the appropriate time in the meeting to do that, I'd like to kind of uh, get back to the comments you made about the turnaround time of the testing. Yes. Uh, if that that benchmark. So, it, to to understand correctly, um, the the impact of that is that if from a infection control standpoint in the community, if you get a quick result, then you're able to uh, quarantine, do your contact investigation. If you're getting that several days later with that gap of a pending test, then the impact of what you're doing becomes significantly less. That's the entire reason why that benchmark is there in the first place. Is that, is that correct? Or could you elaborate on no, that? That is absolutely correct. What's happening now, honestly, is, uh, there are times when we get the report of a positive, and that positive is already outside their isolation point of time frame. And we've done no contact investigations. We've not isolated or we've not quarantined any of their contacts. We hope that person has been at home if they've been sick, um, but that's not always the case. Um, so we've lost, we public health are way behind the eight ball if the reporting time is that far out. Um, for, so for that reason, I, you know, I think we need to do everything we can and we are working, we are working diligently know the hospitals are as well to increase uh, the options for who we use for testing. Um, and if there are other ways to increase lab capacity, that certainly would be helpful. Um, just, I mean, we don't have a lot of control over that. Um, we're actually, honestly, we, we know that we had another lab we were using and they actually told us they couldn't keep providing service for us because they were going to provide service for Nashville. Um, so, you know, the health departments are competing with, you, with each other for lab services, which is uh, an interesting place to be. I bring up that point simply because of, of the five, I think this one is perhaps the least intuitively obvious why that turnaround time is so fundamentally important, uh, but it is, it's just as important as all the others. And it's also one that is uh, this laboratory testing environment, although I think everybody's doing the best that they can uh, has been challenging from day one. And so uh, I, I guess what I'm sensing you say is that you don't anticipate this necessarily getting better anytime in the, in the immediate to near future in terms of that turnaround. Um, we have some, um, actually, I think it, I, and there's not a lot of control any of us have over that. And I don't, I don't, I think the volume's gonna continue, 
your volume is, is high at the hospitals. Uh, outpatient volume is high. Um, some physicians I know are um, not testing anyone who's not symptomatic. Um, and some labs are now saying they'll only run tests for people who are symptomatic. Um, and so there's some, you know, there's been some mixed messaging with that because we've heard others say, everybody please get tested regardless of symptoms. Um, we are internally talking about how do we make the best use of the resources that we do have to make sure the people that need to be tested get tested. Um, and without sending a message that we're turning people, we want to turn anybody away because we don't want to do that. And so it is a real challenge, but I don't know that it's going to get much better. It's one of the things we actually ask the CDC to um, look at how, how is there something they could do to help increase um, the availability of uh, everything from the swabs to do testing from the reagent to send them to the lab in. Um, and, and then we're going to take that back to the, the federal level. Thank you. Um, w w just from a point of order, um, I do have some material to share, uh, which is directly pertinent to the hospital side as well as the mortality side. Would, is, is this an appropriate time for, for me to do that? Dr. Susa? Um, I think it's, if, it's a, if it's related to the benchmarks, absolutely. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yeah. And then. Dr. Shamia, you're up. Yeah, let's see if we can uh, do this here. Um, and then we're going to do that. Can you see my slides? We sure can. Okay, wow, that was, uh, that, that just goes to show you that rehearsing ahead of time really does pay off because we, we pulled, we rehearsed that uh, two minutes before the meeting started. Um, so let me just introduce uh, just kind of my, what I'm going to be sh showing you is that, um, first of all, uh, we now have, we now have our own data. Uh, when we initially avoided uh, this uh, in terms of a significant uh, COVID spike, there wasn't that much data. And so a lot of what was being looked at was things of, of national models and a lot of projections but we have enough experience with COVID-19 at this point that I think there's some things that we can say with, uh, with a significant degree of, degree of confidence. But I mean, the point being, this is really regional, Knox County, uh, a little bit of it, UT Medical Center data. Um, the second thing I'll say is that as we, uh, as I show you these things, uh, that there are a few, and I'll call them out, that are specific for uh, UT Medical Center, but there's nothing special about uh, about us. It's just that the, the one of the physicians on your board happens to be a physician who has access to that data. Um, if it, but there are some of these questions that the only way we could get at the data was at our data. Uh, but anything that I could show you that's broader than us, I absolutely have done that. Uh, so. With that, I'm going to go ahead, and I think these will kind of just march along and tell a story. Um, so the first thing is just these are the people that the University of Tennessee Medical Center has have tested, and so that gives you uh, these these are not hospitalizations at this point, but that just gives you the distribution between male and female, race, and I, I point in particular to the age distribution, which is uh, I think a lot of what you've heard, but there over the last weeks has been a shift over to, to younger people being diagnosed with COVID-19. But I bring that up specifically because uh, I mentioned in the last meeting that from, a, from the standpoint of trying to decide what is the impact of COVID-19, I, I, I said I have from the beginning always focused on hospital utilization, ventilator utilization, things like that because those are pure. Uh, you can talk about whether we're testing more, we, you can talk about are we testing more young people who aren't getting symptomatic, but healthcare utilization is, is I think, the, one of the purest things you can look at. And so this is UT Medical Center information. Um, and this just shows, again, um, a, a gender breakdown, a race breakdown that are very similar to who we've diagnosed. But I think the important thing to note here is this bottom shows the age distribution of the people that we've hospitalized up to now. 
And I think what it shows you, and, and this doesn't give, um, I've got a little more breakdown on the next slide. So it doesn't say how sick they were, or how long they stayed, but it shows that there's no question that we have been hospitalizing a significant number of younger people. And, you know, no one gets in the hospital just, just because, I mean, to, to make, to reach the threshold of requiring hospitalization means that you had something significant going on. And so I think that shows that they're definitely younger patients that have been hospitalized. This kind of digs into the, the age distribution. Uh, again, UT Medical Center, because that's the only data I could get at this level. Uh, but it shows you the positive test results and the hospitalization. So if you look on the right, you see the number of patients that we've hospitalized uh, at the various age distributions, and it's, it's represented across the board. Uh, I'm gonna talk about length of stay next. That's the bottom of this slide, and it'll be my next slide. The reason, so length of stay effectively is how long patients stay in the hospital on average. And that's important because when you start talking about the demand on the healthcare system in general, if patients stayed longer, then when you're thinking about bed capacity, that's fundamentally important. And so our average uh, inpatient length of stay, if you look across uh, all the different disease states, uh, is uh, right at about uh, kind of four, right about five days. Um, and so this shows you based on age distribution, how long patients are staying in the hospital. And you can see that, that a significant portion of these are more than that five days that I mentioned. Uh, and that's the breakdown by age. Uh, now to look at it in a slightly different way, and guys, I promise I don't have, th this is not a 30 slide presentation. So it's, it is, you know, we, we won't be at this for too long, but, but I think it's important. And so um, this is essentially everyone that we have admitted. And we did pull one outlier out that stayed over 90 days in the hospital. Uh, but without that one patient, you see here, we have an average length of stay of all comers, all of our inpatients of over eight days. And so that get the more patients that you have with COVID-19 in your facility, and the more that stay longer than your average. And that just means across the board uh, the, that you are draining more of a, a healthcare resource for just that one specific population. And I'm gonna build on something that Mayor Jacobs mentioned in the context of the health department. You know, the, we, we have all kinds of different patients with all kinds of different medical problems that we still have the commitment to take care of. And so it, that, that's, that's, the import, that's another important piece of this. So, so that was all because uh, data from, the, from UT Medical Center. Uh, this is now broader. This is Knox County data. And so we have an analyst uh, that is able to take our own data and also take publicly available data and, and do these types of, of things. We actually have a, a variety of people who can do this, but what this does is just takes that data and, and does what's known as a regression. But the point is that we are very confident that for every, at this point, based on data up to now, and, and of course we know that this, is, this disease seems to, to shift and, and you know, we get new and more understanding every day, but that's a pretty strong correlation that for every thousand new cases we diagnose, there'll be 52 new hospitalizations. And so I would say that, that what was a mystery about what to expect has become less of a mystery. And if you take the, what's called the Knoxville district, which is a group of counties uh, around Knox County, it shows the exact same degree of correlation, which, which just means this is becoming less and less guesswork and more and more predictable, essentially. And so this is that same region and it just puts into context. And guys, I know I'm kind of getting a little bit, I'm straying a little bit from the hospital side, but all of this data lands in where I'm gonna be, which is what, what's gonna be the impact on hospital capacity. And so the pace of those new cases, what this means that um, it took us um, 81 days to, in the region to get to the first thousand cases, 17 days for the next thousand, eight days for the next thousand, seven days for the next thousand, et cetera. Um, 
this shows uh, new cases by week and by month. Uh, this is Knox County, and I draw your attention to the right-hand side specifically, which says that right now, if you see, we've got 848 cases in July uh, to date, which very much exceeds what we had in the entire month of June. And so that puts that kind of the, you know, Dr. Buchanan shows the, the same information, but that puts it in a little bit of a different context. And that same relationship, if you looked at, at just the broader district, and the reason why I show the district is the healthcare systems and the health and the hospitals don't, don't have a sign at the door that just says, if you are a Knox County resident, come here. And if you're not, I mean, you know, that the, we serve and all the hospitals uh, serve a large, you know, we serve a large region. So this shows hospitalizations uh, by week and by, you know, by week in the month uh, in Knox County. And you see there the significant spike in the last, in the prior week ending in hospitalizations in the county. I mean, visually that catches your attention. And then this shows the, the district. Um, and I, I've, I'll make this point again later, but I cannot emphasize enough that hospitalizations lag identified cases by three to four weeks. So the cases we're diagnosing now, if they're gonna have an impact, or, or I should say not if, the cases we're diagnosing now are gonna have an impact on the hospitals, on the healthcare infrastructure in three to four weeks. So um, this is that Knoxville district, and this is the uh, inpatient census. And so I show this purely to show the, the, the rate of rise uh, just which really started in that last week of June. Uh, and then we've seen an acceleration. And uh, that is, so, so up to this point in my presentation to you, that's all been current data, real data, data that we know up to now. This next slide is the only slide that has any sort of projection for the future. And so this is the median projection. So that what is, it, it could be worse than this, it could be better than this. But this takes that same district and just to, to get a sense of what we're talking about, that's Knox, Anderson, Blunt, Granger, Jefferson, Loudoun, Roan, Sevier, and Union counties. And it takes us really to Labor Day, essentially. And it says that based on just the, the data that we have and the correlation that I showed between diagnosed cases and hospitalizations, if nothing else in the external environment really changes, uh, we're looking at uh, that's uh, 373 inpatients across this district at one time, uh, which is a significant number of patients uh, at one time. And so um, I did want to show this to kind of bring this back home into what this affects. I'm not going to read every, every word on this slide, but these are the, uh, this is now back to University of Tennessee Medical Center. These are the deaths that we've seen or that we've cared for. The first thing I draw your attention to is just how much of that has been since July 1st, which is very consistent with Dr. Buchanan's data. The other thing I wanna draw attention to is simply uh, the ages. There's, there is a 29, 41, 57, and 61 year old person. And we've started to see what you would read about, which is that classic scenario of the person's diagnosed they, they're not in the hospital. They seem to do just fine for several, they're not feeling well, but they're not in the hospital and they're doing okay. And then fairly abruptly, they develop symptoms, end up in the hospital and, and then it, it, it goes from there. Um, the, other, the other thing I'll tell you is that we've had in our own experience, uh, a, a family situation where um, a, a, an adult child uh, has lost their life, a parent has lost their life, and the other parent is in the intensive care unit. Um, and so that's, you know, that's very, uh, you know, it's a difficult toll on a family. And there have been other reports about families that, that it seems to, to happen in that way. I don't think it's understood exactly as to why. Um, so I do want to emphasize this point, and I'm going to talk about surge just a bit. Um, so the health systems that we, Dr. Buchanan mentioned the last meeting, I think I did too. I mean, we, our level of, of in, engagement with each other was already significant and it's accelerated. So we're, we're collaborating. Uh, we're all updating our surge plans to account for 
continued normal operations and procedures. And that just gets back to that point, which is that that original surge plan and the surge plan that's part of those numbers on the benchmarks really took into account that a lot of the other stuff had stopped. But we also saw that there was a health impact to, you know, in the population sense for stopping those things. Um, the systems have agreed to work together to try to distribute that. That's why, you know, that we're, for example, we're, we're at a yellow is you, if you look across the whole systems, everybody that's collaborating, you, you know, there are beds, uh, even if certain hospitals have seen a spike. Um, and so I, I do want to make this point though, is that staffing these additional beds, we've, you know, it's, it's without question easier to create physical space for a bed when you start really surging then to create all the staff. And what we're seeing across the community, across a variety of communities, unlike the first time where it was really New York, New York, is there are a lot of different cities that are running into issues at the same time. So the idea that the, the, you know, the outside resources, this outside staff are gonna be able to be delivered and help every city that runs into a crunch is I think less realistic than it was when it was really just a few. But, but again, I, I, I can't predict the future. Um, we certainly need to be uh, sharing data and uh, you know the, the health systems are sharing data and we feel that we're well positioned and you know, I'm, I don't want to create a, an alarm, but I, but I do wanna be very realistic about what, what a surge looks like. Uh, if, if that graph I showed that continued to go up um, you know, that, that is a very significant uh, drain on the healthcare infrastructure and specifically other, other patients that need care and that staffing piece. So, so that is, uh, I think, I, now I've got to, I'm going to stop sharing and I'd be happy to take any questions. And I may have diverted additional questions from Dr. Buchanan's report. So uh, I don't want to her to lose. Any, anyone can, you know, obviously, Needs that opportunity as well. Did I successfully stop sharing? You did. Well done. Okay. Again, we rehearsed. <laughs> uh, questions from the group? While others are thinking, I've got a quick question. Do, do those projections take into account the return of many students to the university? Um, they do not, uh, specifically. Um, they uh, essentially just take the data that we've had up to now and the case, the rate of case diagnosis that we know of now and then project that out. And so I could, that could go essentially either way. If, if things like, you know, whatever, the, the, something new enters the system, like something opening up like that, uh, it's very hard to model and predict that. On the other hand, um, we know that there are, uh, as we'll talk about the, you know, the, the uh, ability of those five core actions to be, you know, to be consistently implemented across everyone, uh, you know, that, that could have a favorable effect on that. So that, that truly looks at what we know right now, which is based on what society is doing right now, what is open right now, things like that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I guess that's something important to keep in mind for anyone listening is that, you know, models are fantastic and they're really pretty good in the short term, but as things change, that it does sometimes stray. It's kind of like a weather forecast, right? You're pretty good at the next week or two, but it can get a little bit further away from that. Um, other questions or comments from the board members? And I guess any questions about the benchmarks? Too? The benchmarks or Dr. Schmeyer's presentation. All right, um, hearing none, can we pull the agenda back up so that I can find it? On it. Okay, so uh, hearing no more discussion on the benchmark presentation. Actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I, did have, I had to see the agenda to figure out if this question <laughs> is the right time or not. So, sure. um, but Dr. Buchanan, I do have one other question for you, uh, and I think it's I think it's related because it it pertains to your contact investigation and things of that nature. 
Um, do we have a sense in, I understand the challenges you're having with turnaround time, but in terms of where you're seeing cases and larger sets of cases, is there any theme to that? Is there anything that would inform us about, again, I showed a situation that is certainly concerning to me related to where hospitalizations uh, are headed. Um, so is there any theme that you could let us know that you've seen that might impact action? It really is widespread um, in lots of different settings. Um, we don't have, uh, we have no clusters related of patrons in a restaurant or in a particular store or anything like that. Um, we've had some small clusters among employees at different places, but we really don't have, we can't say this is the problem. It's, it's everything from, you know, just social gatherings to uh, some, some, some workplaces and some churches. So it's just a little bit of a smattering of everything. Um, and so, you know, that's where we think going back to the five core actions is really key to um, really reducing this, changing this trend that we're seeing now. Because um, we can't really point our finger at this is an area that we could really have an impact. It's everywhere. So everybody needs to do the five core actions because it's just everywhere. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Buchanan? And I actually did have that same question and I forgot to ask if there was any particular um, businesses or you know types of places where outbreaks were happening and that doesn't seem to be the case. Okay. Um, okay, any other comments or questions? I do have a question, uh, please. And thank you for, that was a, a very well done, Dr. Smith, and certainly uh, those trends are said not to be alarming. You look at it, and it's pretty alarming. Um, you know, initially, when back in March, the discussion was flattening the curve to build up hospital capacity. And now, uh, you know, that was, that was 119 days ago, I think, when the Surgeon General talked about that. Um, what is, and this is a hard question, and I hate to kind of put you on the spot, but as we're looking forward and we're seeing numbers go up across the country and, you know, as things open up and, and, and things happen and the numbers go up, what is like the strategic, uh, I guess, endpoint? Where do we, you know, what, where does this go from here? If you have any speculation, I know I ask you, I know I ask you to look at a crystal ball and predict the future, but, uh, and, and that's very difficult. So, so I can kind of tell you what, um, what it feels like to us right now, and um, at least what, what I sense is going to be, you know, the future and the, and the time frame and a few possibilities. You know, one thing that's notable for me, and of course, I'm very involved with the management of our COVID response, but, you know, it's like I live in two completely different worlds, um, meaning that the level of intensity and the level of collaboration between the health systems and the meetings we're having about the creation of additional space so that we can still maintain the delivery of care to everyone that we need to is probably some of the most intense work that I've done in my, and you know, in fast work, even as this is all played out over a few months that I've done in my entire career. And then I walk outside the hospital and it's, it's just a, it's, it's a different world. It's that, that there's, you know, and not that I expect there would be a keen awareness about what we're dealing with, um, but we have seen, and, you know, we've, we've felt that and we've collaborated, you know, talked with the other systems who are, who are feeling that as well. Um, and none of our other pa patient work has slowed down. And so what, what has kind of played out so far is that it seems that we all reached this plateau for three or four days where we think, okay, maybe that this is just gonna settle. And then we spike again in our COVID population. And then we settle and then we spike again. And so like the comment that uh, was made, um, you know, I think that we really are using the last 10 days to prepare for the next 10, 
you know, sometimes hoping that we're wrong about that because obviously you need to over prepare. What's going to be the biggest challenge is that lag between the diagnosed cases and the hospitalizations because because any action that would have any effect, and again, it could be good or bad. It could be it, it could be something that is done that helps slow this down, or it could be something that happens that actually accelerates it. We're not going to specifically know that. I mean, until we're knee deep in it, uh, because of that lag, and so the, the need to be to have that crystal ball to some extent to use data to use what's happened in other places. Uh, I think it's going to be very important, but I think to, to come back full circle, uh, you know, we're clearly going to be dealing with COVID-19 for quite some period of time. Um, but I think that the, 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 everything I'm hearing about vaccines are positive right now. Uh, I can't give you a specific timeline, but I know that we all, the public ourselves, there's all this, there is a sense of COVID fatigue. And if we can just hang in there, uh, then I do think a vaccine is on the horizon. I, I can't be sure, but I think that we're going to be dealing with this in a very active manner until that vaccine uh, is available. Does that, sir, does that answer your question or do you want to have a follow up to that? No, that, that does. So essentially it is uh, basically we're buying time until there's a vaccine. Hopefully. May I ask a question, Dr. Shamia? Also, um, thank you. One of the concerns uh, would be, and something I've seen looking at other areas of the country, how is this affecting? You feel our healthcare providers locally? Are we starting to see uh, COVID uh, infections among healthcare providers? And then that starts it starts a domino effect within an organization where somebody's pulled out and others are restricted. Uh, potentially. So I didn't know if that's something that's already being seen locally. Um, so the first answer is that I mean, we are seeing um, that b based on our use of PPE, um, the, the, the team members that are and the providers that are uh, dealing with COVID infections because of direct patient care with another patient with known COVID, uh, uh, that is an extremely low. I can't quote that. I'm not even sure if we've, we may have had just very few of that, but that is extremely low. But I think you, you, the point you made is very well taken is that with, with widespread community transmission, uh, you know, we have peop, our team members, again, staffing is going to be a challenge for all of us. And, uh, you know, that there's enough COVID-19 in the community that, that people are, are getting COVID-19. And so um, we have seen, you know, th th that's going to be, uh, that's going to uh, economically, that's going to start impacting more and more businesses, not just in healthcare, because even if someone is not, unless they can work from home, unless their job is something they can work from home, if they get a diagnosis of COVID-19, they're going to be out for a period of time. So healthcare is not probably the only industry that's going to have challenges staffing, but a lot will. Uh, but I can also say that based on that intensity that I described, uh, you are starting to see um, the, the, the frontline people uh, having an impact, uh, a personal impact based on the stress of the work, um, the, the additional shifts they may be asked to do, those types of things. And this is, if I may, this is Dr. Buchanan, um, you know, I, we are seeing, seeing similar um, fatigue in our staff as well. Um, you know, it, it is, it's very intense. And, and I think, uh, Mayor Jacobs, back to your question, kind of what, what I think as a community, our end game really needs to be to minimize the impact of COVID-19 on the health of our citizens and the healthcare system, but also minimize the impact of COVID-19 on our economy. And how do we walk that fine line? And it, there's no great answer for that. We look at countries that didn't really shut anything down and have a lot of cases and, and, and fatalities, it's impacting their economy because you don't have people going to work or you don't, or the uh, people who are the most productive are the wage earners, either are they pass away from COVID or they're just not working because they're sick. So it, it, the disease itself can have an economic impact. So we have to, we have to continue to be vigilant as a community to reduce disease rates and be able to keep our economy being productive and, that's where we've got to have everybody 
back to the five core actions, everybody doing those things together to keep both of those things going. Yeah, there's no doubt this is a, a dilemma that certainly none of us want to face. So but thank you all for what you're doing for sure. Thanks, Dr. B, and thanks, Dr. Shamia. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments from anyone on the, I guess the benchmark presentation and associated presentation? All right, hearing none, um, I guess we'll move on to the COVID-19 face covering regulation review and discussion. And so this is the ordinance that was passed uh, two weeks ago and put into place, I believe, um, a day or two after that um, across the county and um, had a, you know, various stipulations about who was exempt and where face masks were now required. Um, I guess I'll just open it for questions or discussion. Just for clarification, is the, the intent is to, to revisit the topic or? Um... I, I get, I think it's just to, you know, review what, what are our thoughts about how things have gone for the last two weeks. Um, I know personally, I think that um, I've recognized a lack of enforcement of this, um, which is a little bit difficult to have an ordinance that doesn't get enforced. Um, it's not going to have a whole lot of impact if people aren't doing it. Um, there's certainly pushback against it um, for personal reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the CDC came out today and stated that if pretty much everyone wears a mask in the country for the next month or two, we can squash this thing out and really make a difference. Um, so I guess just kind of my observation is that uh, there hasn't been wholesale support from this, um, which is frustrating. And this, uh, I'll, this is such a being again. Um, so I, anecdotally, I certainly have seen more masks being worn than I was seeing prior which is obviously the goal. Um, the enforcement, enforcement piece is challenging. Our staff right now is doing a lot of education and informing of, of people and uh, employers on, on how to, how to uh, do this, providing them with signage so that there's a sign posted that you have to have a mask to come in. Um, so that's in process. Um, it's a real, it, you know, it's a challenging piece um, to enforce, to be honest. I mean, you, uh, you know, Give somebody a ticket for not having a mask on. I know they're doing that in some places. That's not something that's happening here. Um, it's like click it or ticket. We can mask it or ticket. I don't know. Um, but I think it has had an impact. Um, we certainly have got lots of uh, people calling us and um, reporting on businesses and what happens when that happens. We go uh, talk to the uh, owner or the manager, educate them, provide them the signs, give them the ordinance so they know what's in it and uh, try to support them to um, have their staff wear masks and, and encourage their patrons to wear masks as well. So that's kind of where we are with that. Um, those are for the businesses we regulate, for the businesses that we don't regulate. Um, those are sent over, if they're in the city, they're sent over to the city. Um, and some so code support folks and others in the city are following up on those as well. Um, and so, you know, we, we continue to have people uh, complaining that people are, or aren't, aren't, you know, people being rude about about stuff, and that certainly doesn't help anything. On both sides, people wearing masks, people not wearing masks, not being nice to each other. Um, I know that the hospitals have talked about, and I think there's a, a plan, a possible plan in place to try to do more of a, a public information campaign about why you should wear a mask and, and that kind of stuff, and to encourage people to, to be proactive and, and go ahead and wear a mask to protect themselves and others. And, um, and uh, on the mask uh, thing, there is one thing I do need to bring up, and um, that's related to um, upcoming elections. Um, so, um, as you know, um, elections uh, happen in polling, polling places. Polling places are not always government buildings. Um, uh, pre actually, frequently they, are not, frequently they are not government buildings. Um, and so, especially for early voting. Um, so, um, there, you know, the question has come, can we require somebody to wear a mask, which might limit their ability to exercise their right to vote? And so that was a question I wanted to bring to this board. Um, are we willing to make an exception to this to, so that people don't uh, choose not to, or, or we don't want to infringe on somebody's right to vote. We just 
candidates. Um, if the board is willing to entertain an idea of, of making an exception for polling places while they're being used for polling places, people don't, masks are not required for those places. The, the uh, election commission, we've given them some masks. They've worked with us. They have a really good plan. If people want masks, they're going to provide them for them. They're going to provide, <clears throat> excuse me, provide them for the poll workers. Um, so they'll have, have those available. Um, but that's a question for this board. Um, would, would you be willing to entertain an exception for polling places to the map, to the regulation number 20, number 2020-1? So okay, I'll, I'll start on that topic. Um, for, first of all, a, a busy polling place, if you think about everything that I just presented, uh, a busy polling place would be the exact example of a situation where COVID-19, we could get a significant number of cases uh, and then, then it kind of goes right down that sequence that I described. Uh, but I'd also question the idea that, that if someone didn't feel safe voting because they, you know, that they felt like that not everyone was going to wear a mask. I, I think that could be considered a restricted their right to vote as well. And then I, I that's, but the fundamental thing you said that I want clarification on is how does wearing a mask restrict somebody's ability to vote? I, I think it's, um, if I have to have a mask on to go vote, I'm not going to go vote. So you're, you're infringing on my right to exercise my right to vote by making me wear a mask to vote. That I think that's, I, I, I have not been involved in the discussions. I got this phone call like three minutes before I walked in uh, the, the, to this meeting and um, said, was asked to bring it before the board. So that's what I'm doing. So Martha question, how is the ease of voting affected if one votes by mail because of a reluctance to go to a polling place? Is that significant enough? Is it difficult to do? I've, I've never done it myself. I'm just wondering. I, I don't know. I don't think we can rely on I mean, I think, I, again, Mayor, J I don't know, Mayor Jacobs, if you've been involved in any of these discussions at all. I, I'm really, it's not my area of expertise. Um, I think, um, you know, I think that they're obviously infringing on somebody's right to vote is a big deal. And we don't want to do that. So we don't want to be seen as doing that. Um, and I understand the risk. I, I do understand the risk that um, polling places are possible places where exposures can occur. I do know they're going to have a lot of safety. They talk to us a lot. Um, they being the election commission, they're going to space things apart as much as they can. They're going to have, you know, have people stand six feet apart and offering masks to those who want to wear one, who don't have one. Um, so they're, they're gonna have a lot of things in place. And I'll be honest, we may get overruled because that the state may rule that we can't require it in a, in a polling place because it, it could infringe on some piece of ability. And, and Mayor, and Dr. May, that's uh, the first I heard about it was right before this meeting. So okay. uh, yeah, you, you probably know more about it than I do at this point. So, Sorry. That's okay. Um, the challenge is that, that um, you know, we, the, I think early, when Mayor Jacobs, you know when early voting starts, because somebody in the room knows when early voting starts. Uh, it, I think it's this Friday, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think you're not right. I know it's very soon. Yeah. One thing that I can tell you, I've, I've taken a look at uh, the voting uh, issue, and if you look at the form, there is a checkbox that if you are concerned about COVID, you can get a ballot sent to you for this uh, year. So that is possible. The problem is if somebody wants to vote in the primaries, we've already missed the cutoff if they haven't done it for that. So everybody can vote, at least in the general election, everybody, and if everybody wants to get a ballot sent home, they can do so. And all they have to do is check the, I'm concerned about COVID box. And they don't have to meet any of the other requirements. So that is available to everybody, but they have missed the cutoff for the primary. You guys, I'll just say that, I mean, this is my perspective, which I understand my, everybody comes at this 
kind of with their background and their own experience. But to me, of the five core actions, the masks are the workhorse. Uh, and you know, for example, uh, the CDC published this was a few months ago, where uh, two symptomatic people, hairstylists who had masks were around a large group of people of who they were doing their hair. And at least as of the time it was written, no one had gotten infected. And the six feet, the six feet thing, I made the point last meeting that you just don't know when you're gonna, I mean, you don't have just a bubble around you that has a, that keeps people away from you at six feet for any significant period of time. And so while I understand that there's the potential to be overruled um, from a, from a public health perspective, uh, you know the the, the the core actions they they don't pick and choose scenarios where they should apply and where they shouldn't. I mean that's not the way the disease is spread. That's not the way it works. I totally understand the vote the the sensitivity of the voting issue. So you know I I, I, I get it. But from my perspective, my role on here to me this just seems that. If you're going to be in a public space where there's a lot of people where you can't guarantee six feet of distance, um, I mean, we're, you are putting people, those people who couldn't check the box, you're putting them at risk. So that they could just as likely say you are affecting my, my ability to vote because they don't feel that, that that voting place is safe for them. And we know that that's also a hot button is that you can't feel unsafe when you cast your vote. So there, I see both sides. I understand, but that is that's my is my stance. Further comments? So I don't know if this was brought up because I've I've been sort of jumping in and out from uh, to my other room, but um, I don't know if if any of the folks have had a chance to look over the July 9th, um issue of New England Journal of Medicine, but there's a fantastic article in the perspective section entitled Disease Control, Civil Liberties and Mass Testing, Calibrating Restrictions During COVID-19. And it's written by two attorneys who are jointly appointed, it, this is at Stanford and Wake Forest, jointly appointed in, in the schools of law and medicine. And it goes over a lot of things that are, that are unique about this disease that, that we all understand um, that work against the way that traditional um, uh, quarantines and such ha have been affected in the past. But um, I I'll see if I can get that article to everyone. It it's, I think, really good reading because it's an intersection of the medical side of things with the legal side of things. So if, if you've not had an opportunity to look at it, uh, I'll see if I can get it to everyone. Additional comments, questions? It, it seems like we are at a place where uh, additional restrictions don't necessarily need to be called for since we're not seeing clusters in bars or restaurants and that's a good thing. So I think we, I would be more in favor of us continuing where we're at and strongly encouraging people uh, I know there's some people out there that do uh, notice that in certain businesses that people aren't following things. And I know at least in the city, they can call 311 or do a, uh, an online notification to 311 about any businesses that are of concern. But uh, I think just the five core values are what we affirmed with that. And I would probably say that it'd be best to continue it. I, I don't know what else everybody else thinks, but I think that's probably where we're headed. I mean, I think that the, the, what we need to continue with, hold the course based on the data with the mask, uh, with the mask ordinance, the regulation. Yeah, and I would agree with that. And, and I know that the health department is working on stepping up that encouragement and enforcement of that. And I think that that really needs to happen across the county. Um, and I agree that when I've been to the grocery store, I have seen more masks, but I know that there's certainly um, plenty of places that that's not happening. Um, and I think that's really, as Dr. Shmay said, that's our, that's our workhorse. That's where the science is showing that we can actually slow this thing down. 
Yeah, and I don't. I hope we can keep going without any active enforcement, but there may be occasion, rarely, that somebody is going to have an enforcement action against them because of being so blatant. And I really don't want to see that, especially with businesses, because one of our biggest things here is to make sure businesses can remain open. And we don't want somebody to be so obstinate that they do something just to, to make a point. So we want to really encourage people, educate, and kind of lean forward with uh, doing, just basically doing the right thing. And, and one thing I'll bring up right now is I looked at our emails again, and uh, they were a, a tad bit more on the negative side toward masks, but a question came up, where can I get a mask? Well, they can get it from the health department. Well, how many masks is the health department given out? 281,996 masks as of the report today. I'll say that again, 281, 1,996. So if somebody says they can't get a mask, I want to encourage them to come down to the health department or they can look at other areas. There are nice people in the community making masks for free. So I don't think that's going to be an excuse for anybody. I want to strongly encourage them and have them come along so we can get behind this quicker. That I think doing these five core measures will get us behind this very quickly. Or not very quickly, but quicker. So Dr. Buchanan and Dr. Shumay may be able to help out with this, but you know, from our understanding of the incubation times and, and um, the, the sort of the curve, the spike curve that we have, I, I'm not expecting any deflection in that curve due to even widespread mask wear, uh, wearing from two weeks ago for another week or so. Is that, is that the earliest we could expect to see any deflection in the curve? Yeah, so it's an incubation period of two to 14 days with an average of five, five to seven, something like that. Um, but, you know, we, we would expect like probably a couple of incubation periods before we really see anything. So that's a full month, a full 28 days um, um, before we really see any impact because, you know, people were, were seeing the results of before and, and there's a delay in that. So um, I would say we won't really, we can't expect to see much more probably a month, three weeks to a month. Um, and I know that's uh, hard to hear looking at the data we looked at today, um, but I think we, I think we can't, we can be hopeful that it will have an impact uh, eventually. Uh, I would echo that, that, I mean, I, I firmly believe that widespread mask wearing, um, and I understand you, you know, 100% may not be the, re the realistic target, but widespread mask wearing will help uh, flatten that curve, uh, or at least the, the rate of increase in the, in the spike, uh, as will kind of adherence to all the other core actions. But it's too soon to tell. And then the, the question is, it, you know, I, I do feel like I'll say also, as I go out, I see, I feel like I see more mass than I may have seen the time before. And so that may also drag it out even further. So, I mean, is it really from the date that the, of our last meeting that we can judge the impact or is it that people that had an effect, people are watching the data, they're watching what's going on and then they're, they're more masks are being wear, worn. So that the, uh, the true impact of that may, may actually drag out over even longer, but be slower. Any other further comments, questions? Um, I don't know that we need to necessarily take a vote on this as it's just simply continuing what we passed last time. I agree, just, that was, um, the decision was that we revisit it at each meeting. Okay. Um, yeah, so any other further comments, questions about this? I have a question for Dr. Buchanan. Are salon, beauty salons, and barbershops, do they still require appointments? Uh, Diana, you'll have to look at the plan. I don't know what it exactly says for salons. I'm sorry. Um, I believe they're by appointment only, but I can't be 100% sure. You've seen a lot of people waiting at those places, but you haven't seen like any data that would say that that is a hot spot. We've had no clusters related to uh, salons. 
Wait, well, yeah, Charity's yeah, looking. Yeah. Charity's yeah. looking to make sure. But yeah, we have it. And and you know, again, this is anecdotal. But the few that I've been in, and from my friends, when they go to the salon, um, they're really doing a good job. Most of them. So that's encouraging. And like you know, they have the. the I think there was an article or a case report where uh, somebody in the salon who'd been around several people, all of whom were wearing masks, they had no cases, secondary cases. Great. Any other questions, comments? All right. Hearing none, uh, we'll move on to other business. Um, and I'll just open that up to the floor if there's anyone that has anything they need to bring to the table. So, so I have, um, I have one thing uh, that uh, it's actually uh, uh, in a minute, I'll start screen sharing, but it's, it's really a, uh, a draft uh, resolution that I think in, in caps, encompasses or really encapsulates a lot of what we've just talked about. But we look, you know, I, I showed data, Dr. Buchanan showed data. Uh, I can tell you that I'm, I, I definitely have concerns about what we're seeing on the hospital side. Uh, now, just to be clear, the local hospitals have the capacity uh, to handle that right now. Um, we are all working together and we're working on it. And so the, the take home message from what I'm saying right now is not that, that we're in trouble or anything like that, but you saw the projection that, that I showed you that if, if, if those five core actions are not consistently followed uh, by every type of organization and every person, businesses, the schools, uh, although I, I understand you know, that we have certain things we have jurisdiction over that, I mean, otherwise we're, we're going to potentially run into some, some real issues. Uh, and so, so now is the, now is the time to act. And so essentially what I've done, and I'm going to, let's see if we can do this share screen again. Um, can you see that? Oh, wait, can you see that slide? And I don't know why it's not moving forward. So, hold on, guys. Okay. Let's try this again. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Five core actions. Yeah. So, th so th th this isn't anything real novel, right? It's it's the five core actions, but um, with with a slight different nuance. And uh, in that, the um, what I have seen is that even though we've been saying this, the practicality of it is that we're, we need to get this out in, in as many different ways as we can, including in a, in a formal way tonight. And I'll show you, show you the draft um, resolution. But I, I think there are some misconceptions about some of these core actions. So, I mean, they really apply just in the conversation we were just having, I mean, to everyone except for your household contacts. So, for example, um, and I just understand, I've had these conversations with people. So just because someone is a relative, for example, you know, your sister, your brother, if they don't live in your house, they're not a household contact. And so if you ride in the car with them and they haven't been careful wearing a mask, then you potentially could contract COVID. There's nothing magical about the fact that that person's related to you. In the same way, if you have a dinner party and you have eight people over to your house and they're all good friends and you're inside your house. If you don't follow social distancing, strict hand washing and wear face coverings and disinfect high touch surfaces, you are at risk for all of those eight people to, in, to contract COVID-19 and then all the other after effects of that. Even if none of the group gets significantly ill uh, in the hospital, it's still a significant problem. And then they potentially have the ability to uh, infect other people. 
Um, if somebody comes to your house to fix your refrigerator, uh, you know, even in the setting of, of the mask resolution, if, if they do that and they're in there for a while and they're not wearing a mask and you're not wearing a mask, even though it's your own house, uh, that is a significant issue. And uh, so uh, what I, I think we need to do in as many different ways and, and the health systems have worked on this is to try to amp up and in different ways, make this as real for people as possible. Because the bottom line is that right now we, we I mean, live your life, uh, do, you know, do the things you want to do, but follow these actions. But there's going to be some things that, that you do have to adjust how you do them to be able to follow these actions. And so what now let's see if I can show. So uh, can you see uh, that resolution? Yes. Okay. And so just, I'm only going to read a few things off this because I, I attempted to send it with a little bit of advance notice, but the first seven whereas is are simply a summary of the data that I presented to you. Uh, it, it simply shows that the situation is getting worse and how it's getting worse. Uh, the eighth one I'll read specifically uh, because this is so important to guide our actions four months of observational data have shown that any policy change aimed at mitigating the rate of COVID-19 will take three to four wait weeks to have a detectable effect. And so we've got to be anticipating, uh, no one can predict, predict the future, but a little bit of our job description will be looking at data and anticipating. Um, then uh, I, it has not been mentioned in the meeting so far, but the the next whereas talks about the visit that we had from the CDC and the, the, the feds uh, last week, which I found to be an eye opening meeting. It was reported in the paper. They met with the force health systems and they met with uh, Dr. Buchanan, the health department, but they made it pretty clear to us that this was not a random visit. They had identified us as a true hotspot. And so yet again, the, the reason, uh, the reason to, to emphasize these things. Um, then the second to last, the last two whereas is I do want to take the time to read. Um, so it says, if the rapid growth of new COVID-19 infections in Knox County cannot be brought under control through the actions of Knox County residents, businesses, and public entities, further closures may become needed to protect public health and to ensure Knox County hospital systems are not overrun and will be able to continue to meet the needs of patients suffering from COVID-19 and other critical health needs. And to, to Mayor Jacobs' comment before, uh, I mean, I really do think this is, we've got to put ourselves in a marathon and not a sprint mentality on this. And so it's going to take everybody doing their part. And then the other, whereas it, it is vital for Knox County public health, it is vital for the Knox County public health economy in the education of children in Knox County, that the, that the Knox County Board of Health, in concert with the Knox County Health Department, Knox County Commission, and Knox County Board of Education, work to ensure appropriate actions are taken to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and attempt to avoid the need for full or partial closures. And so I, I think the, the point here is that if we all do these things as a society now, then all what Dr. Buchanan mentioned about uh, or uh, someone mentioned about, you know, the effects on the economy, the effects on missing work, the effects on what I'm, my biggest fear is that into sep in September and October when flu season hits and we're still, if we follow that exact graph that I showed and then we superimpose flu season that we, we don't want to be in a bad spot at that time. And then the now therefore part just really essentially, I mean, we can take the time to read if you didn't have time to read before, but it's those five core actions with the additional emphasis on the idea that um, if you, one thing we see is if you have a pending test, you should probably treat it as if it's positive, meaning don't have a dinner party in the midst of waiting on your test result would be an example. Uh, but but th th with the turnaround time being what it is, uh, you know, it becomes challenging, but but a pending test has to be treated as a positive test from a societal standpoint uh, until you get that result. And so, uh, you know, really this is intended to be educational. It's intended to be the idea of, you know, setting those expectations that, that we all kind of wear the same Jersey, you know, 
this is in the spirit of what Coach Fulmer did a few weeks ago when he he tied the ability for, or the the likelihood or the hope that uh, that people would be in the stadium for football with mask wearing. And he essentially said, "We've all got to do our part." This is this is the resolution equivalent of that, but it's also indicating that if we don't we're, we keep looking at that data. There, there may be other things that we have to do. So I'd be happy to take uh, questions about that. And I, I'll stop. Should I stop sharing my screen or leave that up for everyone to see? Um, it's probably fine to keep it up just in case anyone in, that's watching online wants to try and look at it really quickly. Um, I think most of us hopefully have had access to it for a, at least a few minutes before the meeting to, to look over. Um, I open floor for any discussion, comments, questions. Or if you want to take a minute to read it. I don't know if everyone's had a chance to read it yet. Yeah, I think we'll probably need to, uh, speaking for myself, I need a couple of minutes to read it. Okay, so why don't we um, just take maybe about five minutes to look it over. And, uh, could I ask a question real quick from uh, Mr. Morton from the health, from the, I'm sorry, from the law department. Uh, Myers, have you had a chance to review this? Yes, sir, Mayor. Uh, do you have any problems with it according to legal form? It's a recommendation. Okay. Okay, thank you. I got a question for Marcy. Are you seeing anything in animals? People who's had the virus in their dogs or their pets have got had problems? Um, so there's been a few cases in dogs and cats. None of the dogs have been sick. A few cats have actually had a respiratory illness. Um, they've all recovered. Um, I don't think there's really any major morbidity or mortality in our pets. Um, so there was the first few cases globally and then also nationally. Um, but again, there's really no, no, no reason to get rid of your pet. I always like to say that, um, that um, they're more likely to get it from you. And there's really no evidence that our, our pets play any sort of role in transmission of the virus back to people. Thank you. Sure. anyone need more time? Looks like most people are looking up from their exams. <laughs> Marcy, I, I make a, recommend, or a, a recommendation that we adopt these recommendations. Okay, uh, before we get there, is there any further discussion or questions? Looks for rules, we probably just need to have the motion and discussion. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion to adopt um, what is being called 
um, the COVID-19 community education recommendation. Is there any discussion? I'll second that. All right, Dr. Gotcher is second. Discussion, comments, questions? Okay, hearing none. Um, Nardo, would we like to take a vote to adopt <clears throat> this draft resolution? Okie doke. Um, Drake? Diana? Yes. Gotcha? Yes. Hurt? Hurt? She'll probably be just a second. She's having audio issues, I think. Okay. Jacobs? Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Samaya? Uh, Shamia, yes. yes. Sorry, excuse me. Sousa? Yes. Wagner? Mm. Lisa? Yes. Did you hear me? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay. And we're back to Maria. Dr. Maria Hurt. She gave a, she she says, gave yeah. a yes in the chat okay. box. Okay, good. We're good. <laughs> Technology. Uh, yeah. So unanimous, it passes. Yeah. And so this would, uh, it looks like we agree. It says that it would go into effect essentially just after midnight tonight. So again, these are recommendations for how to slow down the spread of COVID-19 in our community. Thank you, everyone. That was easy. Um, so additional, I think, any uh, additional business that anyone needs to bring up? So I had some procedural uh, things. I don't know if that, uh, I, yeah, I guess since the next thing's adjournment, I would say this is the time to to bring these things up. Um, so first of all, uh, so Dr. Buchanan, uh, I think that whatever our meeting cadence is, and I'll, I'll bring that up as my next item, but, but I feel certain uh, at every visit or every meeting, you know, the idea that if there's anything in particular you're seeing as far as patterns uh, with whatever data you can bring uh, as far as your contact investigations, I think that'll help inform the actions of the group, any any way we can make data driven decisions about what we're actually seeing, I would hope that that's what we would want to do. Um, and then that brings me to my next question is uh, this and I brought this up last time I bring it up again just because of the trend in the data is that uh, the uh, we're meeting at every two weeks and as much as I understand that that it does take a few weeks after actions to see uh it, the impact on the data as i've said on the other hand uh the data could change pretty quickly and i know that uh all of this all of the procedural aspects of the the sunshine law meetings and how we communicate that, that's been a learning experience for me and so uh, i want to at least propose the idea of even if it's a short meeting it doesn't always have to be but but whether a weekly meeting to, to review data, ensure that there's nothing that needs to change um, or action that needs to be taken. Uh, the alternative would be that based on data, we, we call a meeting either at the 48 hour emergency timeframe or the five day normal timeframe. Uh, but the, just knowing the realities of, of getting this group together and the, the, the gravity of what we're looking at, I wanted to at least propose the idea of meeting weekly. And if that means it's a 15 minute, week, 15 minute meeting to say the data looks about the same and we'll meet again next week, then I think that would be fine. I'm certainly open to other thoughts or discussion about that. Others on the board, any thoughts weighing in? Should we move to setting a meeting every week or keep it twice or sorry, every two weeks? Would that be a Zoom meeting or in person? I would imagine that we'll probably stay doing Zoom meetings for a while as long as the um, Governor Lee, um, I'm not sure exactly how long his uh, allowing virtual Please. meetings to go till. Marcy, I believe it's August 29th. End of August. August 20th. Okay, so for at least the next six weeks, it would definitely be. 
Thank you. I'm okay with go ahead and scheduling a brief meeting weekly, and then we can have a more in-depth one if we have to have it every other, but to keep it brief, benchmarks, and uh, just reaffirmation, hopefully. No. Oh, my God. <laughs> Narda, I think you're not muted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't <laughs> I'm not sure how we can physically do this. Um, well, with the newspaper and everything. All right, we'll, we'll talk offline. Yep. So I think uh, uh, Martha, could you give, maybe give us some feedback on what you think is feasible for? Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are a couple different ways I think we could do this. Um, one is just to Obviously, we update our benchmarks every week, um, and that's available publicly for everybody to look at. Um, I think the logistics of calling, doing a, a called emergency meeting are, are way more challenging to me than having a weekly meeting. Um, you know, we can publish the calendar, um, and it's out there on the website, which is another way uh, to do that, to get the, the information out to the public. Um, so that people can see when the meeting is going to be. That's what the uh, County Commission does that. They have a published calendar. Lots of other appointed and elected bodies do that. Um, and, you know, we could have it regularly. And it would probably, the, the, every other week would be intended to be a short meeting uh, where we just kind of go over the benchmarks and ask any questions about trending. And then, you know, it could be where, you know, uh, something to prepare for the next meeting. Um, that we, we that we want to, you know, give. I don't know, but certainly we can do that. Um, if people think it would be helpful, we'll, we'll figure out how to make that work. And um, you know, if this time on a Wednesday works for most people, then we can keep it at this time on a Wednesday. Um, if it doesn't, then we can talk about another option that might work uh, better for everybody. Um, I think this time is probably. I mean. I'll make myself available whenever. So this is not a time I have other standing meetings, obviously. So I think given the given the pace of information and given the, the pace of the uh, the changes that we're seeing, that weekly makes a lot of sense for right now, and, and we can change that when we need to. Sure. And it just to, as far as process, are this? I assume once it's on the, are, are there rules about? canceling a meeting like for example if we actually saw a dip in improvement in cases then is a meeting not cancelable once it's on the books uh with the sunshine law uh that's a great question for mr myers yes sir if you want to reschedule it you have to go through the process to reschedule under the governor's order to the end of august you have to have 48 hours notice but to cancel a meeting myers what's the requirement yeah, canceling. Yeah, you can cancel it. But what's the requirement? You say it's canceled. Is there a time limit? Like how far out? I'm not sure. Let me look at something real quick. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um. Okay. So that that may be an option. I know that we we had to cancel a meeting, our meeting back in January or whenever it was, and so I don't exactly remember how long the notice was on that. But it seems like that's something that's feasible. Um, I don't know, do we need to take a vote on this or is this just something that we can decide to do? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think we voted last time. Yeah. To do I don't know frequently to have meetings. I'm not sure. <laughs> it could be consensus, I guess. Sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, I guess Wednesday call, not to call anyone out, but is there anyone, sorry. Sorry, just is Wednesday at five a good time? Probably. That seems like when we discussed it last time, it was probably the best option. Um, I guess it seems like most people are okay with this. Um, is there anyone that does object or has a just can't make an every week possible meeting? And, you know, that these would, you know, we wouldn't have to meet quite as long. Okay. Yeah, and hopefully, yeah, if we have them more frequently, they may not be two hours long. That if we can keep updated a little bit on the data better. Okay. Um, so I guess, Martha, if you can work with your folks to figure out how to make that happen. 
Sure. Okay. Absolutely. And then, um, other business. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say a marker of success of of the five core actions would be that then the data starts to look better and we're not needing to watch it quite as closely. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, and then if there was ever a dip, if there, we had the ability to cancel, we, we could cancel. So, um, but, but I, I think that if we find that we're not really, it's not value added, then we always have the ability to back it out back to two weeks, but given what we see, i so I appreciate your consideration. Hey, thanks. Um, any other business that anyone needs to bring up? I just want to say one thing. I want to echo what the mayor said. The staff of the health department is doing a phenomenal job. and People are just working for the people of our citizens out yeah. there. I have been so impressed in getting information, uh, hearing what's going on in the community with what they're doing. And I just wanted to say kudos to them. and Thank you so very much to every staff member for what they're doing. For all of us. Thank you. I'll pass that on to my staff. Yeah, I think most of us will second that. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Absolutely. <laughs> Tremendous work on everyone's part. Thank you. Any other yes. business to bring up? Hearing nothing, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right. I guess we'll see everyone in a week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening.